I've been studying seals and sea lions since the early 1980s. And I started out as a graduate student uh, interested in population dynamics, trying to understand why some populations go up and others go down. And we tend to think that everything in the world is controlled by human actions, but we've also come to understand that not every change is human caused. So over the years, um, the type of work analysis I was doing drew, I guess, a lot of attention, interest from others, because in some ways, the changes you see at the top of a, of a food web or the food pyramid um, often tells you a lot about what's going down below it underwater. And so by working on seals and sea lions and some of these huge changes that have occurred in the North Pacific Ocean and elsewhere in the world, I uh, was able to learn things about oceanography, dynamics of fish, uh, climate change effects. And it turned out that uh, by looking at the top predators of the world's oceans, you can learn a lot about what's going down below the surface. Mammals, as we're finding increasingly, as more and more people want to use the oceans, extract the resources from the oceans, at the same time as allowing nature to thrive. So we're finding a lot of our research now is designed to find ways to mitigate problems. Uh, how can we coexist? Uh, what steps can be done? Because it's pretty clear that the solutions of the past where all you do is just take a gun or a stick of dynamite, uh, those don't work anymore. Uh, we have to find new ways to coexist. The seals and sea lions were persecuted on the west coast of North America up until the early 1970s, and they were protected. Once they were protected, and it was now illegal to go and kill them unless you were First Nations and were going to hunt for food purposes, um, our populations, and you're hardly seeing any change until we get into the 80s, and then there's a very rapid rise. And, and they're rising, and it looked like they might go to infinity, but then they hit this very strong carrying capacity um, about almost 20 years ago. A stadium full of seals here, and then province-wide, it's 40 plus 60,000, so we have about 100,000. But they've been stable. And it appears that they've been stable because of killer whales. Um, you know, isn't there an overpopulation of seals and sea lions? And, and I think if you were to, if, if a seal or sea lion could talk for themselves, they would actually point their flipper and say, no, the trouble is you. Um, if there's overpopulation, it's the people that are here. Um, if there's competition occurring, it's because of what you are taking out. And, and I think it points to the need for us to have a conversation about this ecosystem that we share at the end of the day. The biggest predator of other fish are other fish. And we often attribute that the problem is only what our eye can see, and we, because we can't see what goes on below the surface. Other thing that we, we tend not to recognize is the benefit that seals and sea lions have to keeping fish healthy. And so certainly if you think about the Serengeti, we often think about how the lion uh, or, the, or the cheetah will remove the slow or sick individuals from the population, effectively removing the weakened ones that actually make the population less healthy. Seals and sea lions do the same thing. One should not think by any means that they're out catching the giant fish. Their, their criteria is not the same as a fisherman's, which is to get the most or the biggest. So, here in Canada, for example, um, we have some species of fish which people prize highly, um, and, but the marine mammals may not prize quite so highly, but we have conflict. So for example, on the west coast of Canada, uh, salmon is a species that is highly prized by people. It is part of marine mammal diets, but they only eat a little bit compared to other species. So for our harbor seals, for example, um, the two species that they just love and eat mostly, it's hake, which most people don't like to eat, um, and herring. And again, most people don't like to eat herring either, it's too bony. But those are the two species. They do eat some salmon. And for some people, eating some salmon is too much. Um, they shouldn't eat any at all. And so that's where we have the conflict. Another benefit too is, is that the fish that the, that the marine mammals are eating 
um, also prey on other species of fish, some of which we value. One of my concerns when, when people talk about the need to cull seals or sea lions is that they see the world as, as you know, ecosystem, there, there's just like two species in it. You've got the seal, you've got the fish. You remove the seal, and that fish that it didn't eat, well, I can catch it. Well, the reality is that uh, every fish that is not eaten by a seal is not going to get caught by a person. Um, there are a host of other predators out there that are just in line. It's like a food buffet. Um, we'll find that, that the majority of the fish that marine mammals are eating are not the ones that most people want to eat, um, but part of their diets are what people want to eat. And when we get into situations such as low numbers of Atlantic cod on the east coast or low numbers of salmon on the west coast, when suddenly you put a marine mammal into the equation, it's like, oh, they must be the reason. And if they weren't there, those small populations might have a better chance of surviving. So I think that often when we have these conflicts, if there is enough to go around for everybody to eat and to catch, uh, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. The trouble is that some of these fish are in trouble. Um, I think in almost all cases we can point to humans as having set up the problem. But when you get these, these species of fish that are at low numbers, it turns out that predators, such as the seals, can now have an added impact on them by keeping them in a predator pit and can keep them down so they can never truly break out to get back. So that's been one of the big concerns, is whether or not the Atlantic cod are in a predator pit, or and could the same thing be happening here with salmon. And it's a theory, it's not proven, um, but it is one of the ecological concerns. There's different types of conflicts. Um, there are conflicts when some marine mammals have specialized in taking fish out of fishermen's nets, or off hooks, um, and that comes at a price, and marine mammals damage gear too, in some cases. So um, there, there is a need for, for solutions, you know, and certainly some have tried things like throwing seal bombs in the water uh, to deter them, shooting guns at animals. I've heard of killer whales still being shot at to keep them from taking halibut off of lines, and the reality is that all you do is make the animal more elusive if you haven't killed it. You haven't removed the problem. And so there are thoughts about ways in which we can find solutions. Um, everything from um, uh, electrified lines or electrified um, gill nets, for example, um, the center current, because the animals are very sensitive. They don't get electrocuted, but they don't like that sort of magnetic field. So there are solutions like that. There's possibility of using um, smells and other things that the animals would find very offensive. I think one of my biggest concerns about culling seals is that um, if you remove 50% of the seals, you are effectively removing 50% of the food for the transient killer whales. And it's gonna cause enormous harm. Killer whales will starve. Um, you're gonna have uh, reproductive failures. Um, and very little thought has been given to who else depends on harbor seals. Right now we're located right next to the Salish Sea and this is this incredible inland sea um, connected to the outer ocean but it's like the Serengeti. Um, we have this um, most incredible wildlife here. We have got humpback whales that have been gone for over a hundred years because of whaling. They're back. We've got resident populations of Pacific white-sided dolphins. We've got harbor porpoise, doll's porpoise. We've got northern elephant seals here. We're even seeing Guadalupe fur seals. And these are two species that were thought to have gone extinct. Um, they're back. Our harbor seal numbers have recovered from being hunted, and if not persecuted, uh, to, to record lows. And our sea lions have also increased. And so when I look out at what we have here, I go, this is incredible. On a daily basis, we have the transient killer whales, the, one of the three types of killer whales we have in BC, but this one specializes in, specializes in eating marine mammals. 
Uh, they are here every single day. Well, my name is uh, Dr. Peter Ross. I'm Vice President of Research at OceanWise uh, in Vancouver. Um, I've been working uh, on uh, seals and marine mammals for over 30 years. Uh, during this time, I've been uh, concerned about the effects of pollution on um, uh, these species that are often at the uh, top of the food chain. But I con I'm confronted routinely with a number of conservation threats, um, including climate change, habitat destruction, uh, and many of the other things that also impact on uh, these wildlife populations. I worked uh, for a number of years as a research scientist with the federal government in Canada, uh, and it was only about five years ago that I moved uh, to uh, OceanWise, uh, where I've set up a, a program, a research program, to look at the, uh, the role that marine mammals play in telling us about the state of our oceans. So to me, marine mammals are wonderful canaries, they're wonderful sentinels, and they tell us uh, about the state of our oceans, the health of our oceans. You know, overpopulation is an interesting uh, conversation for us as humans uh, because we're often uh, observers in the grand scheme of the planet that we're, we're living on. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have a, a serious overpopulation problem um, in the form of us. I mean, there are a lot of people, over 7 billion humans on this small planet right now. And in the case of the most abundant seal in the world, we're talking maybe uh, 8 or 10 million. Uh, in the case of most seal populations, we're talking about numbers in the area of uh, a few hundred thousand or a few million. We have uh, runaway greenhouse gas emissions and climate change, which is diminishing uh, the health of our oceans. We have pollution of all types getting into the ocean. Uh, we are fishing too heavily in, in many cases. Um, at the same time, we continue to release greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and all sorts of chemicals into the ocean environment. Uh, these are bad for the health uh, of fish and uh, marine mammals and these are also bad for human health. So a lot of the things that we're doing to the habitat, to the global environment, are going to have negative consequences for the entire food chain, leading uh, right back to us as well as to seals and other marine mammals. Fisheries, uh, fish stocks around the world have been under severe pressure uh, over the last hundred years because of us humans. Um, historically, uh, there's been a co-evolution of uh, predator and prey, so the food supply for seals, uh, there's been a co-evolution uh, of, uh, of that interaction. Uh, we intervened in, in massive ways with commercial fleets uh, and uh, uh, commercial fisheries op uh, operations and we see a depletion uh, based on fishing, overfishing, malfishing, uh, illegal fishing, too much fishing. Uh, we obviously value the protein that comes from seafood. There's nothing wrong with that, um, but it does mean that we have seal populations that are also facing diminishing supplies of fish, just like us humans. So we're sharing a conservation concern with uh, seal populations, uh, and this is uh, leading to more and more conflict. There's very little evidence to suggest that salmon are unduly targeted by seals, uh, certainly in the Northeastern Pacific Ocean, but also in other parts of the world. So often the commercial stocks are, are the ones we're interested in, or those stocks that are favored by sports and recreational fishers. Um, but the fact of the matter is, Seals uh, in BC are largely eating uh, middle of the food chain fish that are not the ones that we're typically going after. So hake and herring and, and other species. Uh, there's a lot of effort on the part of fisheries uh, management agencies to predict how many fish or how many kilos or tons or hundreds of tons uh, of fish are eaten by seal populations or species. Uh, the problem with this, I mean, it's a useful exercise, but there is one fundamental problem with this, and it ignores the beneficial role that a predator plays in terms of creating, ultimately, a stronger prey population and stronger individuals. Well, we as humans like to manage things uh, and like to have control over things. Um, and uh, as a biologist, I look at uh, marine mammals and wildlife, and I, I see a great um, role for Mother Nature to uh, determining uh, the proper balance. Uh, in some cases, uh, there are situations where a certain population will um, get out of hand. There'll be an overabundance and that'll cause impacts 
on our food supply or on uh, other species. And I think we've got to be very careful when we weigh in um, in a heavy-handed way and take steps to intervene. Because when we intervene, we tend to not always fully appreciate what the outcome is going to be. So often we think that if a population has recovered uh, or if it's overpopulated, that if we simply reduce that population by hunting or harvesting in some way, that this will have a positive impact on the ecosystem. That's not always the case. I think it's virtually impossible to predict what the removal of a portion of a seal population would do. And I think it's unlikely that the outcome would be predictable. The fact is that predator-prey dynamics are complicated, uh, ecosystems are complicated, food webs are complicated, and oftentimes seals are eating other fish that might be eating the baby fish of the prey that we want to harvest uh, in our own uh, fisheries. In other words, if we take out a seal population, we may see an explosion in another predator of salmon or baby salmon. So there are times when we uh, think that by, by taking out uh, the predator that we're blaming is not going to help because we, we might see the explosion of, a, of a, an, un, an unanticipated uh, predator uh, that then goes out and targets the species we're trying to protect. Um, hi, my name is uh, David Costalago. Um, I come from, from Spain originally, where I did my PhD in marine ecology. I am specialized in, in fish ecology in particular and in, in fisheries. Um, before coming to, to Vancouver to work at, uh, at UBC, at the Department of, uh, at the Institute of, for the Oceans and Fisheries, I spent two years in Sweden, almost two years, um, studying the, um, the interactions between the fisheries and the grey seals in the Baltic Sea. Um, and it was interesting for me to see when I arrived here, when I first arrived to, to, to the Pacific, um, that some of the, of the um, seal fisheries interactions were, were very, very similar here to what, what I saw in the Baltic Sea. There is, there is evidence that, um, for example, harbor seals are, are eating a lot of juvenile salmon um, in the Strait of Georgia, for example, um, in the estuaries, in the Fraser River mouth. Sea lions are, are consuming an important amount of, of herring and um, in, in the areas where herring is not doing so well that might be actually impacting the, the recovering of the, of the herring population. And at the same time, while we know that um, the increase in uh, populations of uh, different species of pinnipeds in, in the Canadian uh, coast, might be affecting um, some fish species that are, have commercial interest. We also need to, uh, to wonder why are these marine mammals feeding on this particular fish? Is, is this because they don't have other choices? Um, there has been some studies in, in Puget Sound with, with sea lions feeding on, on salmon uh, because they believe there is no herring available. And herring, herring and anchovy are what we call the forage fish, these fish are nutritionally richer than salmon for, for most pinnipeds because of their uh, content in lipids and some particular fatty acids. So whenever herring and anchovy are available for the, uh, for the sea lions to eat, they will prefer to eat these fish rather than salmon. Um, so that's also important that whereas there is an impact on salmon population, for example, in this case, um, if, if, we, if we take measures to, to rebuild the hiring population, we will probably see that, that these, these pinnipeds will eat less of the, of the salmon. We also have to acknowledge that there are, there are fishers that are, that are having economic losses because of the, because of the impact of the pinnipeds, um, often a direct impact on their, on their gears when the seals or the sea lions try to um, uh, remove the catches from, from the gears and the traps. So um, a way that they're, for example, implementing in, in some countries in the Baltic Sea is to subsidize those fishers that are having economic losses because of the seals and sea lions, in that case, in particular case of the Baltic Sea, only the seals, until the, the fish stocks are rebuilt. Um, 
when, when we try to, to remove a top predator from the ecosystem, um, we risk uh, to impact the entire food web. Um, for example, if we, if, if we open a call for penny pets in, in the Strait of Georgia, we will probably um, um, reduce the, the available food for the transient killer whales. But at the same time, uh, it's not only that it's going to be a problem for, for another species that is a predator of these seals or, or sea lions that we want to eliminate. It's, it's also that since we don't know if the, if the fish are actually being controlled by the, by the predators or by the, by the uh, food production that there is in the system, we don't know if eliminating the predators is actually the solution for the fish to, to, to recover. It will be very difficult to predict um, how seal or sea lion cool will, will affect the, the ecosystem as a whole, uh, because there is a multitude of, fa of factor um, playing a role here in the, in the food web. In most cases, the fisheries are affected by climate change, overfishing and pollution all around the world. Um, if, we, if we remediate these main issues, then we are moving in the right direction to, to guarantee healthy fisheries.